Hello and welcome to another of CTEC's Tips and Tricks videos for EVS and MVS. This video will cover time domain animation of surface data. This video covers the processes to perform time domain animation of surface data such as water tables and ground subsidence. The process described applies to surfaces measured at multiple times at fixed locations, rather than random or different locations at each time. For data which is measured at different locations for each measurement event group, the basics demonstrated in this video would still apply, but the data would need to be organized in CTEC's GMF format versus the GEO format we will discuss in a few minutes. Collection and organization of your data is the most challenging task, but that's not because it's particularly daunting, rather because once you have your data ready, EVS and MVS makes the job of animation very easy. Group your measurements taken over a few days or even weeks into the same date group. Now by that I mean if your entire site is resampled every three months, do not separately list each day when a particular location is sampled. Rather, you want to name each column of your data representing a date group as the average date for that sampling event. The date must be in Windows standard short date format. In the United States, that is typically month, day, year, separated by a slash as shown here. Some database programs, specifically Access, do not allow slash and field names. In that case, use the pipe character and we will convert it automatically. Date groups need not be at equal time intervals. Data should be organized in Microsoft Excel or Access, and measurement date groups should be in columns, and measurement XY locations and the corresponding time-based data elevation should be in rows. Here we're showing an Excel file, and we're going to open that up in Excel. This data is organized in months, beginning with February 1994. We have two columns of XY data and 40 plus columns of date data measured at different times. And then finally in the same uh, spreadsheet, we have the site ID. This Excel file has 48 well locations where groundwater elevations were measured on a monthly basis. There are over 150 cells in the file representing locations and dates where no measurement was taken. These cells representing missing data are blank. We will use the CTEC data exporter to convert this file into our geo format. The process is very simple. We run the exporter, browse the file and open either an Excel or an Access file. The exporter allows us to select the appropriate sheet in the file or table and specify whether there are headers, which there will be for this file. We confirm, confirm which fields, columns represent the data we want and then set some options. So let's begin. I'm going to open an Excel file containing the data that we were just looking at. This file has two sheets, so we specify the sheet that we want and we also make sure that we tell it that the table contains headers since the first row of our data was the headers for our fields. Now you don't have to have headers but you would then need to know which of your columns represent specific fields so headers are very advisable. Now we specify what type of file we want to create. Now This is not analytical data but this is in CTEX geo format representing borehole geology or water table or non-hierarchical surface data, which is what we have here. Because our fields were named properly, um, the X and Y coordinates were picked up automatically and selected here, although if they were wrong we could change them. Um, we also then specify what surface represents the first surface here, first meaning first in time. In this case, all of our surface coordinates are elevations rather than depths below a top column provided separately. We are going to specify our site ID. Uh, the default name we had for site ID um, was not picked up automatically. And now we come over here 
and make sure that all of the appropriate columns are selected for that are represent our subsequent surfaces. We don't want any extraneous things selected. So if this table had other columns, for example, the contractor that collected the data or some other information, we would we would not select those here. So we want only our subsequent surfaces. Our first surface, which is selected here, should not be selected. We specify what our coordinate units are. In this case, they are meters. And if there was a column representing symbols, for example, different types of wells, um, we could choose it here. There is not in this spreadsheet. At this point, we're ready to go. So all we need to do is create our geology file. And uh, we can put it wherever we like. We're going to put in this. By default, it opens up to the same folder as the Excel file that we open. So I'm going to call this. So we'll call it Time Domain Surface Video. It will add the suffix for us. And we hit Save. And it writes this file out for us. When I open the file that we've created in a text editor, it tells us that it was created by the CTEC data exporter and provides the date and time. Um, it has all the appropriate headers for our format. It then has XY coordinates, 43 columns of elevations, and 48 rows of data. We'll now look at this data in MVS and show how quickly and easily we can animate it. Now with MVS started, we're going to begin by reading the file that we just created. So I'm going to instance post samples in the viewer, connect them together, and specify the file that we started with. It's in our geology folder, and it's the one that we just created today, August 22nd. Now, when we read this in post samples, every one of our borings will display all the times. The blue spheres will represent the earliest times, and the red spheres represent the latest times. So we can see over the three and a half year period, this well in particular, which if we hold down the Alt key and probe, is boring 414i, or well 414i. This one in particular had the greatest variation, so probably. Um, a well with the highest pumping rate in this area, and and the others, you know, had rather significant seasonal variation. So we don't want to just look at them this way. We want to take this data, and we want to be able to view the surfaces that they represent. So again, we're going to read the same data, and we can do that by just passing the data file name to Creek 3D Geology. Um, and we're going to tell it to just run with all the default parameters. And it is done. We'll connect our instance geologic surface, hook it up, and now with that module, we can scan through each of the times where we measure data. Now this is interesting, but our data may not be measured at equal time intervals. Now this data is mostly monthly, but I believe there is Yeah, there's one sample here, March 15th, where they actually took a sample uh, on a two-week interval. So even just looking at the 43 surfaces um, for an equal amount of time wouldn't really represent a smooth uniform time domain animation. But because our data has surfaces that are named by their dates, there's a fantastic module in, in our animation library that makes dealing with this data very simple and it's called Time Geology. 
So we're going to replace, or actually insert, time geology in between geologic surface and creek 3D geology. And now when we do this, it's automatically going to detect that the, the initial start date was February 1st, 1994. The last measure date was July 1st, 1997. And I can grab this slider and go anywhere in between and select that as a date. Or I could specify an interval size, let's say seven days, and reset to the beginning and tell it to run. And it will step through every week, interpolating between all the measured states and create a smooth animation. And really, that's it. We're done. Except there are a lot of things we can do. So let's go a little bit further here. Let's reset back to the beginning and add axes to this model. I want to tell axes what our z scale is, our z exaggeration, which we should also connect to geologic surface so they're all the same, which by default they're set to 5. And I don't think that's enough, so I'm going to bump this up to 15. So now we can see our well that's going to have the greatest variation. And when I see this now at 15, I'm going to back it off a little bit to 10. So here we have um, our surface at the beginning time, February 1994. Um, but we really don't want to look, see the post samples posting of all the data over all the time. Or at least we don't necessarily want to see that. So I'm going to disconnect this from the viewer. And then the other thing that might not be completely obvious is that when we connect a legend at every time the, the data automatically adjusts between minimum and maximum so notice that the minimum and maximum elevations are changing in the legend so we need to know what our minimum and maximum values are and and again we can we can get that from post samples just by looking since we connected it to the axes um, we can open up the axes and look at the uh, spatial definition and see that it runs from 944 to 1029 so there's a module that lets us change our coloring the values that apply for our minimum and maximum colors and that is called change min max. So I'm going to disconnect geologic surface from the viewer and from the legend, connect change min max and we said we go from 929 so I'm going to, I'm going to just say we go from 930 to 1030 now, if it goes below 930, it'll just color it as 930. If it goes above 1030, it'll color it as 1030. So now when I connect this to the viewer and the legend, we can open up the legend and set the number of intervals so that we get nice spacing. And we don't need it to run anymore, so we're going to turn the run toggle off. Likewise, we don't need axes to run every time something changes in the data. So we're going to turn it off. Now notice that both of these module status icons now are showing that they have run, but they're set to not run automatically, which is why they have this circle and the stop sign. So now when we go back to time geology and we step through our times, the colors 
are not changing, the legend is not changing, and we handle the situation of having uniform standard set of colors and a single legend that covers our entire time domain. So I'm going to change the step size to be, um, actually let's change it to weeks, and let's go on half week intervals, and we'll tell it to run again. So the last thing that I think we're going to do with this animation is add the date as a title that changes on the screen. So the first module that we need to accomplish this is over here in the tools and it's called string format. It's this this module and let's uh, resume to fit so that we can see everything. And we connect the output time which is the last time port here, time geology, to the first numeric port for string format. And then a string format module is inheriting that date number as this first numeric value, which is F1. So we're going to change the string to read water table on, and then we're going to enter a date. So we change this default function to be date, and then we have to tell it the format that we want. And so th there are many f date formats, and you can look those up in the EVS help, but I'm going to use the long month, which is MMMM, and then DD for the day of the month, and then the full year. When I press enter, we can see what it's going to give us, water table on July 1st, 1997. That's right now the current date in out being output from time geology. So we're going to take this string created by string format, because that's what it does, pass it to a titles module, connect the output, connect that to the viewer, and here we have our string. Now we can put that string wherever we'd like. Let's just for fun make it left justified, and because we're using forward facing font, we need to do that here. We change this to left, can set the size. Let's pump it up a little bit so it's a little bolder. And now we move it over, put it along the X edge here, and raise it up, put it in the upper left hand corner, and we're all set. Go back to time geology, reset it, and we're ready to animate. Now I'm going to maximize my viewer, and I can access the modules here. And when I press run, it's going to start. So I'm just going to move this out of the way over here where we can see run, and so you'll be able to see the viewer better. Okay, so we've completed our animation. We have our final application. And the last step would be to save this so that we can use it on another day. Um, also, we want to know that the animator can control time geology's time. So we can do much more complex animations that include rotation and other effects, having certain objects in the view become transparent or turn on and off. So we have a lot more control. But this is the basics of dealing with time domain data for varying surfaces. And I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I hope that you've learned something. Goodbye.